On the track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. Good afternoon, Charlotte, and welcome. She can't even keep her attention on me for 30 seconds. Start again. And keep looking at me this time, girl. Okay. Good afternoon, Charlotte, and welcome to another episode. I had something really strange happen to me last night because me and Karina and a member of the On The Track team, who shall remain nameless were chatting um, using one of the chat apps on my iPad and the person who shall remain nameless suddenly said that he thought I was a character a bit like somebody called Papa Smurf. <laughs> okay, now you're laughing. Is this a good thing to be? I think it's pretty alright. I haven't really interacted with any Smurf media in a while, but... From what I can remember, he was a fairly nice old man. Old man, I don't know what you call an old smurf. But, Karina, my lovely wife, your adopted aunt, mm. she didn't agree. She said I was more like an obnoxious garden gnome, sitting on a concrete mushroom, shouting abuse at passers-by, just totally at random. I can see that as well. Charlotte, you have very disappointed me, very much disappointed me. I thought you were the only woman in my life who truly understood me. But you're not. You're as bad as all the rest. My name's John Downs. And my name's Charlotte Philipson. And welcome to another episode of On, On the, the Track. For decades, there's been a cultural trope of the disgruntled postman who, after years of doing a job he hated, finally snaps, climbs the water tower in the middle of the village and starts picking off random strangers with a high-powered assault rifle. Well, that's not going to happen here in Woolsery. Why? Because, first of all, the postman's very nice and second of all, there isn't a water tower. But there is. Postman Jim. Postman Jim, Postman Jim, Postman Jim, we're wary of him. And now, Postman Jim will reveal the contents of his sack. The first letter I got here is from Andrew Eastman in a place called Appledore. You call yourself sensible citizen scientist, were you so bleeding silly? Well, the answer to that one's simple. Just take a look around you. Even before the pandemic hit, we were living in an increasingly dystopian society. And now it's like living in something that was foretold by J.G. Ballard 40 or 50 years ago. Doc Shields, my old friend and mentor, told me that the only way to deal with a psychic backlash, which is something I'll talk about in another day, was humour, and he said it was because the old devil didn't like the sound of laughter and would run away from it. Well, I don't know about devils, and I don't know about running away, but I do know that for the last 30 years I've been using humour as a weapon, and that's what I'm doing now. Life is pretty 
damn awful. And if we don't mess about, if we don't have some fun, and if we don't imbue all the things we do with a smattering of surreal humour, it really wouldn't be worth doing. Next! Right, I've got another letter here from all the way Meriky from Los Angeles, from Dick Wiltshire. Do you think that what Leanne saw at Leskin House graveyard was a Bigfoot? I think it's interesting that so many people have interpreted what Leanne and her friends saw so many years ago in the graveyard at the Leskin House on the shores of Loch Ness as one of the British Bigfoots. Now, I'm not saying that these BHM phenomena in the United Kingdom don't exist. I'd be a complete hypocrite if I said that because I've seen one. But I think that it is certain that they cannot be described using purely zoological frameworks. But the interesting thing about this particular episode of a huge running figure moving very fast through the Beleskin House graveyard is that the running man is a well-known trope in Scottish um, folklore and mythology. For example, there is a character called Jack the Runner who is supposed to run up and down the uh, path, the road that leads up to Glam's Castle, the Queen Mother's ancestral retreat. And that's only one of them. There have been sightings of strange, dark, running figures from across Scotland on many occasions. And I think that's what this one is. But I can tell you one thing. If, for example, and this we don't know, but if Liang, her boyfriend and their friend were facing east when they saw this thing running across the graveyard, then we know where it went. It definitely took the left-hand path. Going back to the mysterious head found in Wiltshire, Worthy. Mark Rains from Allsworthy, wherever that is, he thinks it's an Halloween werewolf. God, yuck, you're wee -wee, boy. Thank you for that, Mark. I think it's a very interesting idea. For those of you who don't remember, just before Christmas we were sent by my stepdaughter Shoshana a picture of a head which was found in Wiltshire. And the head, although muddy and severed, brought some interesting responses. Half the people who saw it, and I have to admit, including me, thought that it looked like a canid of some sort. The other half, and that includes Shosh and Carl Marshall, believe that it's a deer of some sort. But we have one dissenting voice. Mark Rains, who is an old friend of ours and somebody that we are very fond of, who now lives in Holsworthy, believes that it was actually the a head of a Halloween mask, a Halloween mask of a werewolf. And if you look at this picture here, you can see what he means. It's an interesting idea, and I really can only say that I wish that the person who took the original picture had given us some measurements, or even better, shoved the head in a jiffy bag and shoved it in the post to us. So if something like this ever happens to you guys out there in viewer land, again, please remember we want sense of scale, samples, and if at all possible, we want to have the specimen itself. So please, Remember that and don't hesitate to get in touch. So you're telling total strangers that they can fill this house up with rotting carcasses, are you? Yes. Yes, I am. Postman Jim, Postman Jim, Postman Jim, we're wary of him. Something that I've noticed a lot over the years is that quite often when we're going somewhere to look for one thing, we come back with information about something completely different. 
And it's not just us that this happens to. This happened to Carl before he even began to get involved with the CFZ. Yeah, uh, when I was in Belize, uh, I went out on a fishing trip on the Keys and uh, on one of the small islands, uh, what we did, we went fishing, we, we'd catch a fish and we would eat some fish on one of the islands and then we'd move on to a different island and do that all day basically. And then on one of these islands, there were some very, very small boa constrictors. Um, they were very similar to the Hog Island boa. They were quite small and quite pink. And um, each tree that had a, one of these snakes in it tended to have an osprey also up in the same tree above it. And um, I wonder whether or not these snakes are actually a distinct species that are actually isolated on the, on the keys. That's interesting. I've not heard of them from there. I would like to go back actually and uh, actually go get one mm -hmm. and just to find out. And you're sure they, they, these were boa constrictors, they not were. rainbow boas? Oh no, they were absolutely boa constrictors, yeah. How big were they? Uh, about three and a half to four feet long. Um, they were all about that size. There was quite a few of them on the keys and uh, nothing any bigger than that. So it's probably uh, island dwarfism, so they could be, it would be like a snapshot of evolution there in yeah. the process of speciation. It would be worth going out there and, mm. uh, and collecting some. I have two stepdaughters. The youngest, Olivia, works on and off as the CFC company secretary. And I truly wouldn't be able to do what I do without her. And the oldest, Shoshana, is a vet. And she became very well known to people who came along to the Weird Weekends for her presentations on the links between mystery animal reports and veterinary medicine. The subject that's on everybody's lips at the moment is the coronavirus. And although at the beginning people said that it was only humans who could get it, which always seemed to me slightly dodgy considering as it was supposed to have originally been a disease of bats, more recently it's now been admitted that various creatures can and do get the virus. So I decided to ask Shosh, who knows damn sight more about the subject than me, to tell us all about it. At the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, people were saying that it didn't affect animals. Now, it seems that that thinking has now changed. Yes, we know it can affect animals. Um, I don't know, because the original... SARS virus could affect animals, so I don't really know why people thought it wouldn't affect animals now, the current one. Especially as it probably came from an animal in the first place. Yes, or a virology lab in Wuhan province, depending on how much of a conspiracy theorist you are. So what animals do we know that it can affect? Um, dogs. Uh, and cats have tested positive, mink have tested positive, ferrets have tested positive. Um, it seems to be, I mean, mice and rats seem to be a bit more immune to it, which is actually a bit of a problem when you think about research, how often they get used in research. Um, pigs have... <laughs> Pigs have historically, I think, been um, considered vulnerable, which could be a problem when you consider how widely pig products go into the food chain. But I don't think studies so far have shown infection of pigs. Um, chickens and ducks don't seem to get infected. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can be. I've read that big cats in zoos are testing positive. Um, there was one tiger at the Bronx Zoo in New York that tested positive. When was that? That was beginning of April. Um, so, yes, they did have a lot of the, um, several of the tigers and some lions had symptoms, but they only tested one because it requires an anaesthetic to test a tiger, so they didn't consider that it was a 
worth the risk knocking them all out to get um, swabs from them. They only tested the one and assumed that it had spread to the others, which is reasonable. If a cat has tested positive for it, can mm -hmm. it spread it to humans? Um, there's no evidence so far in the field or in studies that it could, but at the same time, I don't really see why it couldn't. Mm. How would a cat um, pick it up? Well, all the cases of dogs and cats and tigers and minks so far um, have been from humans. Um, there's been human to animal transmission, so like a reverse zoonosis. Um, in the Chinese research, they did have evidence that it could spread between cats and between ferrets, but you know that the research wasn't peer reviewed at this point. Um, so at the moment, all the known cases are uh, human to animal transmission. So and they've all been in contact with human COVID nineteen patients. So people cough and sneeze on their pets like they would other people, I suppose. What's the prognosis if your pussycat has um, uh, COVID-19? What's the prognosis for it? Uh, good. Um, no, none of the reported, no reported case of a cat dying from it. Um, cats seem more likely to show symptoms, um, but none of them have died. They've all got better and had mild symptoms. The tigers and lions in the zoo have all got better. The reported pet cats have all got better. There's a report um, earlier this week, actually, about a dog in the Netherlands that was put down, um, sadly, with respiratory symptoms. And it's been reported by the mainstream media as euthanized due to COVID-19. Um, I, I don't know. Um, it was the dog tested positive for antibodies and its owner had COVID-19 um, and the dog was put to sleep with breathing problems and they said, oh, the dog had COVID, but I don't actually know that you can say that was the case. <laughs> no, the dog had breathing problems and also tested positive for COVID. They're not necessarily the same thing. No, especially as it tested positive on antibody testing. Um, I've not seen anywhere that it actually had a swab taken for a sort of virus infection. Um, the antibodies will only prove it has been exposed at some point. And moreover, it must have been exposed two to three weeks before the blood sample was taken um, to be zero positive. There's been a lot of talk and discussion about human COVID-19 cases that there are people with antibodies and there is now a antibody test that the government seems um, impressed with, seems comfortable with, but it's still not known whether having antibodies in your system means that you're um, immune, or at least partially immune or temporarily immune. Is there any knowledge about immunity in animals? Um, I don't think there's any knowledge that I'm aware of of immunity in animals um, to the SARS virus. I, I'm not aware of any information about um, the SARS, uh, you know, the COVID-19 virus, um, duration of immunity in animals. The, you know, cats have had their own coronavirus for a long time. Um, and that's been studied extensively. Um, and we know that those cats don't become immune for life, having been infected. Um, they can be reinfected, you know, multiple times. So it's a coronavirus like the one that's circulating now. It's not the same type of coronavirus. Um, the one that causes um, COVID-19 is a beta coronavirus coronavirus, I believe, whereas the feline one is an alpha coronavirus. I don't know enough about viruses to know how different their behaviour would be based on that classification, but um, cats 
are not immune for life from their coronavirus, and I have no idea where the humans will be from theirs. Um, coronavirus is a, one of the causes of the common cold as well, which, you know, we keep getting reinfected with, and I don't know if that's literally a different virus each time or whether it is possible for humans to be um, reinfected with the same common cold viruses. You'd have to ask the doctor. <laughs> Well, people have been trying to get a cure for common cold since at least the 1930s. Uh, mm. Time and hydration. I think brandy, brandy, chocolate, and going to bed for a long time. Well, yes, it's not a good idea to. I, I don't know. I think it's a good idea to rest when you've got um, cold. As a nation, we're not very good at doing that. I'm not very good at doing that tend to keep going to work and carry on but um, I read that book by that heart surgeon what's it, what's it called a famous heart surgeon wrote, wrote a book and the number of cases he had in there of like myocardial um, viral induced myocarditis causing heart failure was frightening where people, normal people with no pre-existing heart disease got a you know, cold virus and the next thing they're in heart failure that's a very jolly <laughs> subject to end on, Josh. Mm. Thank you for that. An extended version of this interview has been made available for Patreon subscribers, and articles that Josh has written on the subject are going to be in the next episode of Animals and Men. Have you heard the latest news from our government? No. What is it? They say you can return to work as long as you're spaced out. Well, some of us have been doing that for years. I thought I'd share with you a nice example of a British mammal making the best of the lockdown situation. We've all seen it in the newspapers now that wild animals across the world are going into areas which are usually inhabited by too many people, basically. And in our absence, many wild animals are making the most of this. Um, I'm going to show you a nice example which is local to me. Um, basically, about two and a half weeks ago, I was walking my dog Loki through the village, through my village in Warwickshire, where we, when we came across a, a, a roe deer. Um, it's got a sort of reddish coloration, but it, it is a roe deer. Um, roe deer have that colour this time of year. Um, it's quite large, the antlers are probably about this this high on the top of the head. Um, so it's not really young, it's, it's, it's a good, good age one, good size. It's been here now for about two weeks. Um, it doesn't show any signs of being stressed at all, it's quite happy, it's got all the food it wants, it's got plenty of grass, it's got plenty of, there's even water, and even a water source there if it needs to get extra hydration, if it doesn't get enough from from the grass, say. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's there now. Hopefully, we'll we'll go try and find it. Um, I can't really justify going out specifically to film a deer during the lockdown situation. So basically, what we're going to be doing is taking Loki for his second walk. Um, you'll know, you'll probably see that the camera's a bit shaky, and you might hear him breathing funny and maybe barking at other dogs or something like that. He, he has a habit of doing that sort of thing. Um, but that's the only way really we can justify going out and doing this. Uh, he's been there now for the last two weeks, so there's a really good chance he'll be there now. So we're going to go and uh, hopefully we will see a beautiful roe deer making the most of lockdown. Okay. See a little bit of the red coloration. She's very alert. Knows I'm watching.
absolutely not doing any harm whatsoever. Nobody knows he's even here. sign of any movement. He's just watching me. Beautiful. this. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. Jared. Hello. How are you, Michael Tortoise? Doing very well, thank you. Tell me something impressive. Uh. I mean, I saw some Skylarks. That's impressive. I haven't seen yeah. Skylarks since I was, or oh, crikey, much younger than you. Let me guess, mm. top of Hartland Cliffs, above Hartland Key. Yeah. I think that's there was what I saw. Sorry? There was, there was like a field with like people telling to keep their dogs on leaves. That's brilliant. Because I like to clown this. Did you just see a like, cat? Yeah, that, oh, I thought it was that. Is that you? Look who it is. It's this episode's special guest star. Tina! Hello everybody, it's Peanut! <laughs> he doesn't want to do this. Nah. Rosie Ruby's doing something or other, I don't know, she just left the room. Rosie Ruby was brilliant on the bit that I didn't actually film me on. Hmm. Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is actually the second, no, the third time we've tried to do this. The first time it didn't work at all. The second time, Charlotte and Rosie Ruby, her cat, looked absolutely par excellence. And you couldn't see any of me apart from the top of my head. And they just accentuated the bald bit. And mm. now this is the third time. But I honestly did see Skylarks at the top of Heartland Cliffs back when I was a boy, when I was about 15. Yeah, you, yeah. You didn't see the chuff, did you? Because there's a pair of them there. No, I didn't it? see any chuffs. We saw another bird, which we weren't quite sure what it was. And I think we found out what it was, but I can't remember what it was now. That um, really good natural history there. What was uh, What did it look like? Um, it had like a black head and like a red um, chest, red-ish chest. Uh, a red start? Um, I love the way you're looking up. Is this your screen above you? Yeah, we installed the monitor and computer and stuff. Oh, Might have been that. What a red start. Yeah. Look at the black red start. Yeah, that's there as well. No, that looks a bit. Mm, it might have been. It was often like the um, electric wire, so it was kind of hard to tell. 
what so you need, kind of like what you need to look out hmm? for is something that looks like a crow but with a slightly curved red yeah. beak because they're the national bird of uh, Cornwall but recently yeah. they flew over and there's, there's one pair nesting in Devon at Hart and Key. And you know who it was? It was one of us who first saw it. It was Lars, of all people. He comes all the way from Denmark and he sees mm. a pair of chaffs. He's a bit like a sort of magnet because he and the boys came over to spend Easter with us. Oh Lord, quite a few years ago. And we went out for a walk at um, Farmington Quay and we saw a spoonbill, which is something I've never seen before in the wild, ever. And we see it, Lyle seems to have one of these sort of a wild talent, as Charles Fort would have put it, to sort of attract strange birds. I could say something crude here, but I won't. Because there were ladies present. Well, one lady anyway present. Mm. And if uh, Rosie Ruby would have been counted as a lazy as well if she was there, but she's not. Pardon? I said Rosie Ruby would have counted as a lady as well, but she's not. She's not there. Yeah. So, my darlings, Charlotte and I are here to say goodbye to you all, because it's the end of another show. It has been a very strange one, because everything has gone wrong. Charlotte and I made really, really, really good... Um, What's the word? Resolutions to be able to do lots more videoing than normal through the magic of um, the remote stuff like this. And basically, Corinne has been very ill. She was back in the hospital yesterday. She's back out again. She goes back in tomorrow. So I've spent more time being a solicitous husband than I have been being a web TV show presenter. And I didn't want to let Charlotte present it all by herself because you know what would happen then. It would just get full of sort of drunkenness and bad behaviour. You know what she's like. Not young people are like these days. But seriously, on top of that, I've been ill and it's all gone. Everything we planned has gone horribly wrong. But we have just about managed to get out a new issue of On the Track and guess what, Charlotte? I've already filmed the intro for the next on the track. Well, Except who? I decided not to use it. I decided to put it in this on the track anyway. So you guys will already have seen it. And it will also make it obvious quite how much of a libel it was me suggesting that Charlotte would turn the show into drunkenness and stupidness. Because Charlotte has got a bottle of water, haven't you? Yeah. Almost finished it. Trying to drink two of them a day. And that once was a bottle of gin. It's actually got diabetic fruit squash in it. But it was once a bottle of gin. Charlotte left it here last time she was here. She turned up with those drunken bikers and started causing a fuss. So we had to reject it because she was being so noisy. Do you think anyone will believe that, Charlotte? No. No, I don't think anyone will either. It's been an interesting show to put together. I hope you all enjoyed it. Charlotte, you who haven't seen most of it, I hope you enjoy it in a few days' time. And so until the next time, for me and Charlotte, let's see if we can do the synchronise. <laughs> Be seeing you! <laughs> Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's me again. Over the last few months you've probably noticed that On The Track has changed. Well, there's a very good reason for that. The thing is that between 2000 and 2017, that's 17 years for those of you who can't count, I was the main promoter of an annual event called The Weird Weekend. And it was a conference aimed at about and for people from the Centre for Fortune Zoology. And although it wasn't all about cryptozoology, it was all full of events and lectures and film shows and ex exhibitions on subjects which I thought that people from the Centre for Fortune Zoology would be interested in. And it was all wrapped up in a nice overcoat of surreal fun. And you know what? 
I miss it terribly, which is why about six months ago I decided that I was going to rebrand on the track. I thought we'd do a monthly episode of about half an hour and then in between each episode we do what I call on the track extra which resurrects somewhat of the feel of the old Blues Weekend. And have a look at these two examples which I chose almost at random because I thought that you might enjoy them. 